In the Bible, Paul explains that everyone has two bodies, a physical body and a spiritual body. Mediums use their spiritual bodies when they act as a communication bridge between the physical and spirit worlds. As a spirit speaks, mediums hear the information using the ears of their spiritual bodies, then repeat the information to other physical people. Mediumship is synonymous with the biblical term, gifts of the spirit. The focus of our show, Making Known the Unknown, is to provide knowledge through the use of Reverend Hewitt's mediumship and Sidney Schwartz's research. The Bible contains the history of psychic events, along with man-made doctrines created by priests centuries ago. This show will explore the untruths which the Bible entrenched into our society. By uncovering these untruths, we encourage people everywhere to think for themselves with a critical mind. Hello, and welcome to Making Known the Unknown. I'm your host, Tina Tarek. And this show, like what you saw with the previous few minutes, is really about getting our viewers to open up their minds and think for themselves. And that is because of the research and the knowledge that my two very esteemed guests have put together. I'm also going to ask our viewers tonight, because we're going to cover some very interesting information that you will need to know in the future to make sure you pop a tape into the VCR. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce my guests. Sydney Schwartz, middle school teacher, of course, not back to school yet, not right? Yet. <laughs> and Bible researcher from Hackensack, New Jersey, all the way up from Hackensack, New Jersey, I have to mention. Yes. Welcome, Sydney. Thank you. And Reverend Carl Hewitt, pastor and founder of Gifts of the Spirit Church in Chesterfield, Connecticut, and medium. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, uh, I will announce the title of our show. Uh, tonight, which is Gifts of Prophecy 2. And if you recall, the last show that we did was titled Gifts of Prophecy. But like what happens so many times, we have so much information that we just can't get it all in one show. So that's going to be the topic of the show tonight. But of course, before we jump into that, we would like to get into a little bit of current events. And we've also had, as usual, uh, some people emailing us with very interesting questions, which they are informed that it will be covered in the, sh in the upcoming shows. So I would like to do that. Um, I guess one of the first things that I wanted to talk, talk about that's probably most prevalent in people's minds at this time is um, the blackout. And of course, when I bring up these topics, my guests may not decide to discuss them, or maybe may not discuss them in great depth, but nevertheless, I've had questions, and I'm sure many of you have had questions out there as to maybe uh, what was behind this blackout, because it doesn't seem that we're getting any answers these days. And I know these two men here are very good resources for information. Well, I was told that uh, the system in Canada, in the, in the vicinity of Niagara Falls, uh, uh, was where the, the problem was. It was something in the equipment that caused it, uh, because this country, we're overloaded, and a lot of the equipment is, is, is old. It should be replaced. But it was something dealing with, I don't understand it, but they simply told me it was in the Niagara area, which is where they perhaps get a lot of their energy from there. And uh, I don't know how far it affected Canada, but uh, that was where it was coming from. Okay. So I'm just wait, waiting and watching to see what they will say. Okay. So you didn't suspect anything to do with any type of sabotage? No, I didn't okay. see that. All right. No. Okay. Now, as most of you viewers may or may not realize, um, between Sydney and Carl, you really get a lot of information sometimes before the general public gets it. And I, and I, and I like that because we get the straight truth most of the time. And that's why they're so valuable as guests because they have access to that truth. Um, thank you. Um, one of the other pieces, actually there's a couple of them that I want to go through, um, that's kind of a hot topic these days, and that's the uh, removal of the Ten Commandments in the Alabama uh, Judicial Building. And 
I see you both chuckling a little bit, so <laughs> I bet you've got something juicy to share. And uh, does Cindy, do you want to start first, Cindy? You picked up the Bible. Well, the one thing that I noticed about, about it is that uh, when they w did a close-up on the TV about showing what the monument looked like, I noticed that the Ten Commandments w was severely edited. They didn't really type, put everything in. For example, and I'm reading now from the King James Bible, uh, that the Gideons place into, into the hotel rooms. Uh, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water uh, uh, under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to, the, to thyself to them and shall serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. Well, a lot of questions come up right, right there. First of all, According to the Ten Commandments, you're not supposed to have any kind of idols, any kind of images at all in, in, any, in any kind of the worship. And uh, Christianity was found on, on, based on these Ten Commandments, as so many people are claiming. But yet, when you go into Catholic churches, they're full of statues. So at some point dur during, the, during the Catholic uh, uh, evolution there, they, they decided to dis disobey this commandment, which is kind of interesting. Second of all, when, when it says that I am a jealous God, if there is only one God, who's he jealous of? Right. Jealous right. of whom? You know, it, does, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Just, just, just like so many Christians think that, that uh, you know, that uh, these Ten Commandments came directly from God. And if you read in the 19th chapter, it says that God spoke them through trumpet mediumship, that the voice of the trumpet grew louder and louder, and, and um, uh, God, spoke in, uh, God spoke through the trumpet. And yet, while he was talking, if God's that jealous, as it says in this thing, the only person I could think he'd be jealous of would be Satan. And he didn't talk about that. Hey, watch out for Satan. He's mm -hmm. out to capture your soul and to send you to hell. He didn't say that either. And he had a grand, grand uh, you know, time to do that at that point because he was talking to everybody. And physical people could hear the voice of God because it was coming through the voice of the, tr voice of the trumpet. So the, these are all the questions that I, that I have when I, when I saw that monument, you know. And... Uh, the other thing that's been interesting, I've been hearing a lot of talk, uh, discussion about this on talk radio, about how, the, how this country was founded on the Judeo-Christian beliefs. And technically, that's, that's incorrect, because the, uh, the founding fathers, both George Washington and, um, um, and, and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, they were all deists. They believed in a god, but they didn't believe in religions. So. Um, it was quite interesting that, you know, and, and certain commentators on the radio have been br bringing this point home. We're not really founded on, on Christian beliefs. We're, we're, we're founded, uh, the, these people believed there was a God, but they didn't believe in the religions. Because they, 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 they did not think that any of these organized religions had anything to do with, with, true, with tr true worship of spirit. Now, and thank you. Now, in fact, you are researching that too, sort of a side note. Right. And you're finding this out. Yes by all of the resources that you are connecting with. Mm -hmm. So the Ten Commandments are abbreviated and not really from God, from spirit is what you're saying. Well, what I'm saying se. is on, on that monument that they, they hold mm. so, so dear, they, they definitely abbreviated and they definitely mm. let out the, you know, left out certain parts that, right. that of course, didn't, they didn't want to get involved with. Very interesting. Okay. Carl, any thoughts? Well, first of all, I've had a lot of calls and everything else, and they asked me to mention this because of new viewers. Uh, I'm a medium. A lot of people don't even know what that word means. I'm a medium, and I have the gift of clear audience, mean clear hearing, because you can go in the Bible, and it says, and the voice of the Lord came to me, and the voice of God came to me, this type of thing. Well, if that happened back in those days, why doesn't it happen today? Mm -hmm. Well, there are, there's quite a few mediums that are coming to the surface today. You could see them on television. And, uh, but I've been hearing voices all my life, and I asked the question, I asked the question, did God really write the, com uh, the Ten Commandments? And the entity, the ascended master that, uh, that's with me said no. They were written by men between the year 325 and uh, 386. Oh my goodness. And they were changed many times, and there was a lot of fighting going on uh, with, the, uh, with the priest that was writing them, because each one wanted what they wrote written. They wanted it written down, 
and there were others that uh, was ev evidently superior to them, and uh, we can't do it that way, we have to do it this way, that type of thing. And as Sidney said a moment ago, and, and the entity, A1, said to me, he's always saying, get the people to use their own mind, think for themselves. And as he said to me one time, um, if people would think about this, just think about it. If God wrote the Ten Commandments, then why didn't he, as Sidney mentioned, why didn't he say to the people, like for instance, the Eleventh Commandment, mm. don't, go, don't go to the house at the end of the street because that's where the devil lives. Don't do associate with him and right. all of this business. Right. There was not one word said about that. You see? And so the energy said to me, think about it. If it was God that wrote it, he certainly would have cautioned the people. He said it was written by men. You would think that that would have been on top of the list to yes. be concerned about Absolutely. versus some of the other items. Especially Absolutely. if he's a jealous God. Right. That's a good point. Jealous of who? Yes. Right. Jealous of who? Very interesting. I, I'd like to add to what, what Reverend you had just said <clears throat> because years ago I would have gotten very upset with what he just said as far as far as, okay. as the Ten Commandments being being altered. Right. Um, Awan told me at one point that the Jewish Bible which, which, which we did Torah, which is where the Old Testament comes from, which contained the Ten Commandments, was, was totally edited by the, by the Catholic Church. I had a very difficult time believing that. Uh, it, I spent about three years researching thing, things about it until I did, did find did find where certain Jewish books were, were edited by Catholic theologians. However, my, my cousin was a professor of Jewish history in, um, in Columbia University. And I once gingerly mentioned that to him, and that you know, the, the, the Torah mm -hmm. would have been edited by the Catholics. Mm. He said, oh yeah. You know, he, he apparently knew it very, you know, right off hand. He said, of course they were. Now, what I did find out was that after, in 391 with Emperor Theodosius, he started a whole reform to wipe out anything that was counter to what the Catholic Church was setting up. And they went to like the places like, uh, they closed down the, the, um, the Greek, the Oracle of Delphi. They stopped the Olympic Games. They went to uh, the Library of Alexandria and they burned that to the ground. And what they did was they had these, these armies of priests and they would go from town to town, and they would go to the, Jew to the Jewish uh, sections, and they would um, demand that the Jewish people hand over their scrolls or die. Really? So most of them handed over their scrolls, and they replaced it with the ones that they edited. Let me add And I did find historical documentation to prove that. Let me add something here. Okay. They were originally called Christian soldiers. They really were soldiers. And they would go through, and if you didn't convert over to their religion, you know, chew. So sword. that's really where that term, yes. you yeah. know, onward Christian, Christian soldiers. Christian soldiers. There, there, was, there was an economic mm. depression in those days, and these people had no other way of making money. If they, jo if they, if they joined this army for the, of the priests, they would be fed. So that's, that's what they did. So they, they, ended up do, they ended up doing all this. That sounds very familiar and repeating itself throughout many places right. and times in history. If you, if you take the old swords way, way back, and you hold it like this, the sword itself is a cross. Right. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. Later on, they changed it to the priesthood. So it was religious war. Yes. Yeah. Really. Now, Reverend, you, you was talking about why doesn't medium should happen today as far as the church is concerned. And that is because in the Catholic Council of Carthage in 391, the church announced that inspiration, which would be automatic writing and prophecy, uh, ceased with the apostles. In other words, the apostles were the last ones who had these gifts mm. and everything else stopped, mm. which wasn't true because it, it did exist for another 200 years and, and, and all this was being carried out within the churches. But this, this is what they said in 397. But it just didn't get recorded anymore. Right. They just had to take with, well, they what threw, they... they threw the mediums out of the churches and they wouldn't let them prophesy okay. anymore. And then, and then they went back and said, well, it stopped, you know, 300 years okay. ago. Okay. 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 All right. In 1975, I was told then that a movie was being made at that time, whereas the producer was, was influenced to do it mm -hmm. constantly, night and day and night and day. And that turned out to be Spielberg? Yep. Spielberg. In, what movie was that? Encounter. Uh, uh, First. Oh, Close Encounters. Close yes. Encounters okay. of the Third Kind. Okay. Yeah, and they released it in 1977. Really? Strange that Gifts of Spirit Church opened the doors in 1977. I wonder if he knew that he was influenced by that as well. Yes, I got word that Very he was. Very interesting. I got word hmm. from somebody that knows out there.
therapists can definitely convey oh, yeah. their spirituality. But they hate to get into it because mm. there's too many people that try to tear them apart. Sure. They're hearing, hearing, hearing word, uh, sure. voices and all of that stuff. You know, since you mentioned that, there's something in uh, current events that I wanted to talk about, too. And this has to do with Mel Gibson's new movie, The Passion. Mel and I had had a question that I wanted to pose to the two of you about uh, why he was influenced to do this or what, what you think he might uh, be doing this for, the reason for that. That is, an, uh, that is one spot in the history that everybody has been leaving out. Mel Gibson uh, was influenced by spirit to do that. It's like the last link in a chain of okay. events that happened in but, his life. But now I understand that Mel Gibson is ultra-religious. He's very, he's Catholic, he's very... So, so if in fact spirit is influencing him to, yes. to play out, evidently this is the yeah. last 12 hours of Jesus' yeah. life while he's being tortured, um, and spirit is influencing him to do this, I wonder if he knows that spirit may be influencing him to do this to actually just tell the rest of the story yeah, so people can decide story. for themselves, or do you think that he thinks he's doing it to support his religious beliefs, no. which are that everyone died for, uh, where he, actually Jesus' sins. No, Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. Mm. Okay. My brother here told me that. He says, I did not die for the sins of the world. He says, I went through a horrible death. I died for the sins of the priest because they could not deal with him because he was teaching something that they didn't want anything to do with because they didn't know it. Now, from what I was researching, uh, many of the um, religious websites are taking a liking to the fact that he's producing this film. And, and, and they're really thrilled that he's doing this uh, because in their minds, it's um, talking about Jesus and anything to do with Jesus has to do with religion, so it must justify and back up what they all believe in. Um, and... I wonder if, this was my secret thought, that by bringing and calling attention to this, people may actually see, because of its graphic detail, I've seen some pictures um, about this movie, um, they may think twice about how could it be that people can do something to other people, because he was, after all, a man, and why was he really being tortured? And what connection does that have to do at all with any type of religion other you know, than just violence? You know, if anyone wanted to, to be consistent in the way they view the Bible, if they go back into Genesis and, and, uh, and Abraham heard the voice of the Lord clairaudiently who said, go, go take your firstborn son up into the Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to me. So he went and he, he was just doing what, he heard, what the voice told him to. And just before he was ready to kill him, the, the, uh, let's kill the son, the, uh, an angel came by and said, hey, don't do it. We don't want you to do this. And then, then in the Bible it says, don't sacrifice your, your son and your daughter to the, to the god Moloch. Hmm. Why, would, why would a god want any human sacrifice? He didn't want it in the Old Testament. Why would they want it in the New? It doesn't make any sense. Well, this uh, particular article, uh, which is written by a, a, a pastor from uh, Oregon, and it's the, the website that I referenced is the um, Baptist Press, actually says uh, that... Uh, He's actually quoting uh, Gibson. This is a movie about love, faith, and forgiveness. He, Jesus, died for all mankind. He suffered for all of us. It's time to get back to that basic message. I have a friend out there that's a minister, too, and he said all the ministers out there, it rains so much, they all get rusty. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, so this movie will be out, I'm guessing, sometime in the fall, fall or winter. I think there's a rating on it. Um, I bet it comes out at Christmas time. Mm. Yeah, wouldn't that be right? Wouldn't that be great timing? And uh, we'll see what happens. I'm hoping that it will change people's minds when they see the graphic nature. And I think their focus is that will it will probably make people more religious fanatics. Mm -hmm. But we'll find out. But there's always a certain amount of people that will complain about these movies, anything to do with religion. Mm. It's unfortunate they don't understand the truth about it. You know, it's it's funny is, is when I was talking to you this week, Carl. You were mentioning um, that the New York Times had been running some articles mm -hmm. about uh, a person who was saying that the Virgin Mary was not, in fact, a virgin. And um, I was trying my darndest to look something up with, reg with, you know, with regards to that. And for some reason or other, I couldn't find that information on the New York Times uh, pages. But um, 
along with people really understanding uh, the fact that Jesus was a human being and he had all these horrific things happen to him by human beings. Right. Um, I did find something from the Sunday Herald uh, from the BBC about Mary not being a virgin. And this was, in fact, a documentary that they put out right before Christmas Day. So I would find that very interesting if they would, they would uh, uh, do the same passion. Well, um, she didn't ascend. Okay. According to what he told me, when I finally admitted, uh, finally accepted the fact that it was him that was corresponding with me, and when he identified himself, um, he, I asked him about his mother, and he said that his mother died at 87 years old. She was very heavy in the build of the body because she loved sweets, and everybody, after he passed, everybody would have an excuse to go to see her or talk with her, mm -hmm. but they'd bring sweets, and of course, she ate every all of the sweets and just packed on weight and died at 87. And she did not ascend, as they try to tell us she ascended. She was buried very close to where the, the tomb was that he, his body was put in. Really? But when he, they put him in the tomb, he knew, he knew that is, he, his spirit body knew he had to go back and get that body. And he went back and got the body. And uh, he lives in another dimension. He went back and got his mother's body? No, he went back on his own oh, body. Oh, to get his own he body had you're talking to. about. Okay. He had to. Because they would have probably He's more alive than it. we are, but he's in another dimension. Mm -hmm. I don't call it heaven because heaven is what we make ourselves. And uh, the knowledge is stored in our soul so that that knowledge is our passport that takes us into the other dimension. And he's with his mother now? Well, his mother is there, but I don't think that they're that uh, right there in yeah, each other's right, way, right. you know. Okay. Like this one person told me not too long ago that uh, that they were promised that they would be sitting on the same bench between them if they oh, did really? certain things. Oh, really? You know, I told that person to go soak their head in a in a boiling water. <laughs> so how is it that people talk about Mary being a virgin? Partially because of the prophecies in the Old Testament. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it reads, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a token or a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. The word virgin that we have in English really means a young woman in Hebrew, the, the actual Hebrew world that's oh. there. It just means a young woman. It doesn't oh. necessarily mean a virgin. Okay. So, so this, this is all is, you know, as far as I know, in the New Testament, the word virgin is not used to, in, reference to, in reference to Mary. He told me that his mother was uh, an Essene, okay. an Essene, and he said it was a large group of Essenes. It was a group of people that lived in an oasis way out in the desert, and they had what you call a stopover with the caravans going across mm -hmm. the desert. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they kept their belief system to themselves. They meditated and they communicated with the other dimension, and every one of them, by the way, was a prophet. Mm -hmm and she was born to uh, her mother and father were both involved in that. And he had been watching her from the other dimension. He'd been watching her and she was so pure that when she came into her first season of blood at thir about 13, mm -hmm. he implanted himself in her womb and that's how that worked out. It was not through copulation. And uh, he said that they have made so many different stories about it. Well, I, I can imagine, excuse me for interrupting, that a lot of people wouldn't buy that story about him just going into her body without a physical man being, you know, involved as far as that goes. So what, what yes, I, but spirit could do anything. How about the doctors are down in Brazil? I saw those surgeons. You saw the surgeons mm -hmm. there. You saw the operations right. taking place. Right. The spirit people have the ability to go into our bodies. And, and if you think about it, basically today we have the technology where they can go into, into a, a uh, with playing with the genetics, remove all the genetics mm -hmm. and put, the, put another set in. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what Jesus did because according to the Immaculate Conception, um, he actually programmed his genetics so his brain would be working 100% so that he could do all the gifts of the spirit. He mm -hmm. had to go in and implant mm -hmm. himself and arrange the genetics that way because the genetics, uh, the genetics that he had to work with wouldn't have allowed him a, a, a the access to 100% brain power. I would also imagine the people of that time, if people today have a hard time with that, and we're supposedly technologi you know, technologically advanced, what would people in those days have thought? Or maybe they wouldn't have understood that. No. And so it always remained a mystery of mm -hmm. sorts. Sure. So it probably never even got written down anywhere 
to get changed again, like mm -hmm. so many versions of the Bible have right. that you've researched. This okay. is going to be a shocker to a lot of people. Mm. He said to me that it's too bad the University of Mind Control was ever organized on this planet. And he says it covers all religions. It's like a huge umbrella covers all religions. He says, look in the part of the country, world now that there's a war going on. He says, that war wouldn't be going on if the people knew the truth, if they knew that God was within themselves. And there's two points in the Bible I'd like to bring up right now okay. where Jesus at the well, he told the woman that God is spirit. You see? John 4, 24. And then that's when he was alive. But now after he died, he was Paul, Saul, as his medium. And there's a time, I think it's in chapter 15. 15, chapter uh, 40 of the, second, of the first book of Corinthians. He's talking, he's telling us that we're born with two bodies. We're born with a physical body and we're born with a spirit body, the spirit body which is within. Now you stop and think of that. If the spirit body is within all people, isn't that telling us that God is within ourself? So when I do my prayers, I say, Lord God of my being, mm -hmm. I do not visualize somebody in the sky, out there in a piece of real estate in the sky. That's not where God is. This is why we got so much hell on earth here, because everybody's disconnected. Everybody's disconnected. Now we were talking about prophets, and I'm going to connect that to tonight's show topic, which is uh, the gifts of prophecy too. Um, and what I wanted to do is uh, have people again understand, um, and you just talked about it a little bit, um, what psychic phenomena means. Well, first of all, let me explain this. Mm -hmm. We in physical, we live in a time flow. The spirit world is in a no time, no time. So when the spirit within me has the gift of, uh, of um, remote viewing. They can see in another time frame, way into the future. Just like the time I called the uh, uh, FBI mm -hmm. and I told him about the vision I was seeing with President, uh, uh, Reagan. President Reagan. Okay. And when it, uh, I told him about him being, uh, he was going to be assassinated mm -hmm. and where it was going to happen and everything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took it down, they recorded it and the day it happened, within two hours' time, there was two FBI men at my door. Really? You know? Really? It was as if I was, had done it. Right. You know? And uh, they have a record of, I can't help this. Right. It's always been there. And uh, a lot of times it's bothered me and with all the abuse that I've taken. But uh, here was a time that I saw this happening in the future. It was about two or three months after I saw it that it happened, see? I couldn't tell them the day or the hour, right. just like Jesus couldn't tell his right. disciples the day or the hour will happen. So the gift of prophecy is one where you're able to predict certain yeah. things happening. You right. see a vision, okay. and sometimes you'll see something that will indicate the season. For instance, you might see uh, the trees with golden leaves on them and coming down fall of the year, or snow, winter, mm -hmm. flowers in spring, okay. something like that. No, I, I have a list of quite a few <laughs> prophecies, Carl, that Sydney has shared with me and you have shared with me um, that uh, you have uh, made. And um, we also have something very special tonight that you brought with you to illustrate uh, one of these prophecies. And if you don't mind, I, I want to start with that. Sure. Um, you had a business partner, yep. former business partner, and... Um, he was going to uh, have open heart surgery. Right. Um, and evidently you were telling me when he awoke, he had a vision of a certain entity. And I'm gonna leave it there if you wanna well, take it from there. Uh, prior to him, him having, having this, you see, I had a vision. I saw him on a table one time and I saw this lady standing on the other side, the elderly lady, and she was trying, she was speaking English, broken English, you know, she was French, Canadian French, and she was very worried about her grandson, which turned out to be him. Hmm. And I saw these men, and I saw a man standing there holding this thing in his hand. It was his, his heart. He had taken the heart out of the body. Oh my goodness. So I really thought that these daughters were forming, performing an autopsy on the body, but it was an open heart surgery, and she was 
trying to get me to warn him. And then when I did warn him about his smoking, uh, he said, don't talk to me about your little spirits. And I said, why do you say that? <laughs> and he says, well, that's why uh, he was taught, uh, he was taught way back, that's why women wear hats in church to keep the spirits from getting in their hair and they taking them home, see, mm. you know, like they're flies or something. Oh, that's so silly, okay. And so, uh, <laughs> anyway, he had to go through open heart surgery. And prior to that, I was talking to him. Anytime he was willing to talk, I was talking to him. I was not trying to cram it down his throat. And uh, when the last minute, when he had to go, he didn't notify his family. He, know, he wanted me to be there. I don't know why. He wanted me to be there in the intensive care. And he was very bad. They didn't think he'd pull through. And this was in the Hartford Hospital. And uh, he could just about move his fingers. And he cautioned me to come to the, to the bed. And I went over to bed. I, he whispered to me. He says, your Indian was here. Oh, my goodness. When I went up your Indian was here one of your spirits right yeah yes. and so uh, about six or eight months after he came out of the right. hospital right. he stopped by the house one Sunday afternoon and he says I have something in the trunk of the car it's kind of heavy I wonder if you'd help me uh, take it out so I went I said Gee, what have you got in this thing and he says well take it out and put it on the lawn here and and open it and I want to show the people okay please do please this is do what this. This is the statue of the Indian. Most people that know me and know the work I do, the, the name is Lone Eagle. Mm -hmm. And Lone Eagle, uh, I told him before he went into surgery, I said, the Indian tells me that he's going to be with you and he's going to help you. But you see, at that time, he couldn't talk back. He couldn't say, you know, I don't believe in this or anything. But the Indian appeared to him as he was coming out of that uh, uh, operation. Wow. And he said he searched all over, and this bust was the closest thing, uh, bust that looked like the Indian that appeared to him. Okay. And he smiled. He said, told me that he smiled, <laughs> and he seemed to just disappear. Now, since then, you keep this? This has been in my office. Okay. Everybody right. that has ever right. been in my office would remember him sitting over here. It's the first time he's ever been out of that office in 30 years. Really? Yeah. What an honor. <laughs> Welcome, yeah. Lone Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> what does Lone Eagle think of this? <laughs> I haven't heard a word from him. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's carried away with these cameras. Well, Sydney and I saw something happen bef uh, back of us here yes. earlier, which we'll share with you later, but we won't do that until we know what it is for sure with our viewers. That's somebody else I'll tell you about. Okay. <laughs> okay. See, Carl already knows. Yes. It's very handy to have Carl around. Yes. <laughs> it's one of my mischievous friends. <laughs> well, that's about what we saw. Yes. Okay. <laughs> They're all here tonight. Okay. Um, there are quite a few other things that you have um, well, what, predicted. What, one of the things you wanted to talk about is when you played the t uh, a tape for Lenny. Of, oh, yeah. Yeah, you wanted to okay, talk about please, that. Okay, please, please do. Last week or the week before that, when I told him about this great uh, entity that uh, took over the bodies of this woman and the tape that the, the uh, lecture that he did in London, mm -hmm. which I think is the most wonderful lecture I've ever heard in my life. I've listened to it over and over again. And uh, that's the one that really shook up a lot of people from the leaders of churches all over the world. It happened in London. And so I was talking to him about it, and one day I said, would you like to listen to this? And he said, yeah. And so I turned it on, put up the boom box, turned it on, and he started listening to it. I think it went 18 minutes in it. And I thought this man had gone crazy there. He started screaming. Now, it's not real to hear a man scream, but he was yelling and screaming. Really? And, shut it off. Shut it off. It was as if he was dying himself. This is your business partner we're yeah. talking about. Okay. All right. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was really frightened because I didn't think that he was saying that because of the tape. Mm. I thought, my God, what's right. happening to this guy? He's right. going nuts. Right. And uh, he was really screaming at me to shut it off, and I finally shut it off. And he went out of that house. I don't know where he went to. <laughs> went for a walk or something. It just, it did something to him because I think it had a lot of effect because this entity's lecture, I mean, there's nothing left out. Because I've been trying to tell him, I said, you know, 
you'd be wise to just open your mind and think. So you know, evidently, this lecture had something to do with something that contradicted his religious beliefs, probably. Oh, yes, probably. Abs yes. Oh, okay. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah, it shows you the power of, of the mind control that they have, that when, when they hear something that goes against what they've been programmed to believe, that uh, they can't deal with it. And they can go to a point where they're almost freaking out. Wow. And he finally did wow. tell me, uh, uh, somebody else told me that knew him very well, that back at the time he went to, he was in, in his home, uh, in his youth, he said anything like that would contradict what he's teaching and that would be a mortal sin for him to even listen to, you see? And this is why he was frightened. All of a sudden he was scared to death. Bolt of lightning coming down and taking him. So that literal, literally could reflect the pains yeah. of opening your mind mm -hmm. if your yeah. mind has been so closed and yeah. programmed sure. for so many years, yeah. so many lifetimes for that yep. matter. But before that, there were many times that uh, things that I saw mm -hmm. and told him it came true 100% at the time that he was going to invest money. And he introduced me to this man, and I said, that man is a charlatan. I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest a dime with that mm -hmm. guy. And sure enough, it was uh, two years later, it was on the front pages of uh, one of the big newspapers here in the state. Now what you, he did. you talked about President Reagan and what you saw yeah. of what happened to him. Yeah. Um, but there also have been a few other uh, predictions. And uh, I'm going to just kind of throw them out. And if you want to just respond and okay. jump in. Um, credit cards? Oh, God. Yeah. We, I was uh, in another city here in New England. I was a member of the Chamber of Commerce. And we were sitting around. Uh, the table and the bank, one of the, the bank president, the only bank president in that little town, was sitting right side of me. And all of a sudden, I saw this credit card, you know, this card. And I said, you know what you people would be wise to do? You should come out with some sort of a credit card for a little uh, merchant. And that way, instead of the, the customers owing the merchant money mm -hmm. and then and the merchant having all of his money tied up you know in accounts receivable mm -hmm. I said uh, why don't you come out with a some sort of a ch credit card so that the bank can give the the dealer the businessman the money and you pay the bank because you've got plenty of money to play with right. he said I was crazy and of course the credit card came out six years after that really yeah <laughs> But you didn't get any credit for that, did you? <laughs> no. no, literally. Um, another one, smoking uh, in the Surgeon General's announcement? Yeah, that was at a time uh, A1 came through. I didn't know A1 then, but he finally uh, told me later on okay. it's A1. And he said that the human body was never, never created to, to take any kind of smoke in, regardless of what it is. It would be leaves or uh, brags or paper or anything. He says it's not really uh, not. So it's actually totally unnatural. Yeah, he okay. said, don't smoke on any level. I've never smoked. Every time I wanted to smoke as a kid, you know, with yeah, the other kids, sure, sure. they would knock it out of my hand. Isn't that something? Even the Indians, when they had their smoking ceremonies, they would take the the smoke in, into their mouth so that it would affect. The, go up through the opening oh, up to the brain, but they wouldn't okay. take it into the lungs right. okay. because that that would like start suffocating the body. Isn't that something? Never so in the lungs. Right in a wrong way. Mm. Never in the lungs, but in the brain. Okay. Well, they used that for ceremonial purposes to change their state of consciousness. Um, what is this change of currency? I hear I, I read something here about the change of well, currency. Well, uh, Carl had had. Uh, um, <laughs> prophesied quite a while ago that, that they would change the, our, the, our dollar bills, you know, our, our, our money and the, and the way it would look. And he said they were, it was going to go to amber. <laughs> and of course, a few years ago, they did change, change our bills, you know, but this, right. they're still right. green. But from my understanding, they announced that sometime this fall, they're coming out with a multicolored bill that's going to be reddish in color on the oh, back. you're kidding. The greenbacks are going away, and there's, there's the amber bills. And I think he did the, this prophecy at least 12 or 15 years ago. Yeah, and about that time I also saw that them putting a stripe on, on the $100 bill and yeah. then eventually it would go to 20, uh, to 50, and to 20, and to 10, and to 5. Really? And they did that. Now, we were talking about prophets, and whenever you hear people talk about prophets, you think about biblical times, mm -hmm. ancient history, but Carl, you're doing this now. Mm. Other mediums could do this now. Some do. What, what's the 
what's the reason why this is such a bad thing now, but back then it was acceptable in the Bible? I'm going to turn that over to Sidney, because I know that he there, knows. There, there's no difference. I mean, what, ha what happened, be, you know, biblical times still happens today. In fact, I'm looking for a verse right now <laughs> to, to read. Um, with uh, dealing with um, Elijah um, in the 17th chapter of the first book of Kings. Uh, this is a prophecy that uh, the, the word of the Lord came to him who was I, uh, Elijah saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please get me a little water that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of and a bowl and a little oil in a jar. And it, so it goes on here, and basically she feeds him and takes care of him for many years uh, because he provides, he does a ports. He makes, he makes his, the, uh, the oil and the, and the flour multiply, and they, and they both eat. So here, here's this prophet okay, or medium, being told, go to such and such a place and this will happen, mm. okay? Uh, it's very similar to an experience that Reverend you had had, you know, obviously not in biblical times, but, right. you know, up right. some years ago, where he was driving along and his car was running out of gas in upstate New York. It's the same type of thing. Why don't what you happened? tell the story? What happened there, Carl? <laughs> well, that was when I was in the beauty business and we had a lot of wigs and you couldn't give them away. And so uh, <laughs> I had a lady that stopped in. She was married to a sailor here in the area. And she said, why don't you go up to where I came from? She said, women don't even know what they are. She says, they'd all be go crazy and buy these things. So I worked it out and did a wig party, as they used to say. <laughs> and we loaded the trunk with wigs and went up there, one of my, customer, one of my uh, employees. And uh, we stood on our feet all day long that first day. And she says, gee, it's too bad we don't have any time to, to visit around here. She says, These, the, the woods and everything here is beautiful. And I, <clears throat> so I didn't sleep very much that night because I was so tired. She didn't either. And so... We both wound up in the kitchen having some coffee, and I says, let's get in the car and take a ride. She says, I said, sure. I didn't pay any attention to the gas. Oh, right. I thought there was a gas station somewhere around there, but it wasn't. <laughs> this is way up in the boonies near Canada. And uh, so the light went on, and I said, oh, my God, there's nothing on this highway, no roads and no uh, houses, no gas stations, no nothing. We kept going. And I heard a voice, and it says, go on down and take the road on the right. So I got down, way down and took the road on the right. She said, well, we're going deeper into the woods. Where are you going? <laughs> and she says, that light is going. She says, my God, we're, we're at least five or ten miles from the house. And I says, i got to go down here. I heard a voice. I didn't hear no voice, <laughs> she said. <laughs> I said, I heard a voice. I'm going to follow what I'm hearing. So we went down, and there was a lot of construction. Uh, uh, well, there was big... Uh, uh, earth movers mm -hmm, and things. Mm -hmm. They were getting ready to do some construction down in there. And uh, the voice told me to stop. I stopped right side the road. There'd been a heavy frost that night. And so I got out. She thought I was going to relieve myself. But <laughs> I got out and I walked across <laughs> this field. There was all these big machines <laughs> and everything else. And I went way over there. And this was come, just coming daylight now. And there was a five gallon can. It was frozen to the ground because it was so cold at night. And I unscrewed the top, and there was liquid right up there. I, I touched it. It was gasoline. And so oh my I screwed the thing back on, dragged it over to the car. Yeah. And it was a Lincoln, and there was no, I had no funnel. Right. And to pour that in the, in the car, I was going to pour half of it on, on the, the side of the car and all yeah. over the grass and everything else. And so I did pour about half of it into my car. And uh, so I said, give me $3. Gas was cheap then. <laughs> give, give me three. Give me three dollars, and I put them over the cap, screwed the thing back, took it over there, and set it right down in the same spot. I said, oh. I'm not going to steal this stuff, oh, you know. Was, so you left the money. For I the left the money there. There's I wondered nice. what the guy ever thought. <laughs> <you know? laughs> that would be funny yes. if that got back to you. <laughs> I mean, what, I've often wondered about that. And so we had enough uh, gas that we drove around and everything, enjoyed ourselves, went back and had <laughs> breakfast with everybody and started the day's work. <laughs>
What a story. But they told me exactly where that gas was. But how different is that than what happened to Elijah? Not very. No. Yeah. I don't get how somehow then it was okay and now it's not okay. There's the average person hearing this <laughs> has to know that something very strange had occurred from the times these these, these writings are put into a Bible. Uh, uh, well, again, it, it was what happened at the Council of Carthage where they said this all stopped. And, right. then they, and then they convinced everybody that the gifts of the Spirit are the work of the devil. The other thing, too, is you read the Bible and it says, the voice of the Lord came to me. Hmm. You see, anyone, any time that a person ha heard a voice in those days, it was out of respect that they would call that entity the Lord. They would never say, John Doe uh, talked to me, or my father talked to me. It was always the Lord, you see? That was out of respect for that entity. But I don't do that when I do readings. Now, uh, Sydney, um, you had mentioned that you had a few other excerpts also that represented prophecy um, from the Bible. I don't know if you wanted to share those as well. And one had to do with Jesus. I was particularly interested in that one. The prophecy about him evidently coming to the earth, being born, so on and so forth. Okay, well, we'll, st we'll start there then. You want to do that? Okay. Um, in in uh, Isaiah chapter 9, through, uh, verse 6, there's a prophecy of Jesus' birth. And it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. This is a rather famous prophecy. It's mm -hmm. in the Handel's Messiah. He did, he wrote a song okay. u using using these words. Right. Um, so that the, it's claimed that Isaiah saw the birth, the birth of uh, of Jesus with with this prophecy. Um, also, he also prophesied his death in in chapter fifty three, verse seven through nine. And it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep, he was silent before its shears, so he would not open his mouth. And you know, you know when it, he, um, in the book of Matthew, I think it's just mm -hmm. towards the end there, it's verse 63, I can't remember which chapter it was, and they, he's brought before the, uh, before the high priest there, and he asked him, are you, are you the Messiah? And it says, and, and Jesus was silent, he wouldn't respond. Uh, so that, that kind of fulfilled this prophecy. Uh, verse 8 says, By the oppression and judgment he was taken away and for, and for his generation who, con who considered that he was cut, cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people whom, whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was given a rich, uh, a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And of course he was buried in... Uh, uh, Joseph of Amethia's grave, who was rather a, a rich person as opposed to, um, right. to uh, you know, a pauper's grave. Which is what he was. Right. Now, what I find interesting is if people didn't revere prophets as important and their messages as important, then nobody would have known or cared that Jesus was going to be coming into this into the world at that time. Well, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of statements in the New Testament where it says that the, that the uh, the Pharisees got upset with what Jesus was was saying and they wanted to seize him, but they were afraid to seize him because the people knew that he was a prophet and they were afraid of the people. They were afraid to be a, a mob because see the people always revered the prophets right. because the prophets was was the one person who can tell them what was going to happen. You know the the prophets were always around the kings. The kings wouldn't go to mm. war without without consulting their prophets. Mm. Mm. They they they. They were, con they were constantly in demand for, for, for information, and, uh, and in fact, when we were talking about Elijah before, when he, was, when he went to Zarephath, that's because he was running away from the king, because he went before the king and told the king that he wasn't doing what, what, what the spirit wanted him to, and there was going to be a drought, and he basically told the king off, and he was afraid for his life, and then he went and fled, and this is, this is how he ended up in Zarephath. So it seemed like the prophets were okay as long as they were telling people what they wanted to hear, and not the truth which was, you know, straighten yeah, well, exactly. up your act or face the consequences. Right. Right. Now, you had uh, another passage in here which you were sharing with me, and it had to do with um, oh, here, here it is the there. dried bones. I don't know if you wanted to share that sure. as well. Yeah, that's uh, dealing with Ezekiel. Okay. And Ezekiel, um, 
This is chapter 37, it's verse 1 to 14, and we probably won't read the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but it says, And the hand of the Lord was upon me, which is another way of saying that he was, he was in communication with spirit. Right. And he brought me out uh, by, uh, by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley and was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I see he was having a clairvoyant vision here. And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. And I will put sinews and make flesh go back on you and cover your skin, and so forth. Um, it basically goes on here to to uh, to to this this uh, prophecy mm -hmm. um, goes uh, is, was used to really people think it's dealing with the Holocaust that took place in the 1930s really? and 40s yeah 25 centuries after it happened really? because basically after after so many uh, six million Jews were killed in in Europe it was right after that that the state of Israel. Uh, was created and it basically says and here it is verse 12 says therefore prophesy and say to them says, says the Lord God behold I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves my people and I will bring you to your land of Israel okay so here you know obviously the great you know there were so many millions killed in Europe uh, with with the mass graves and it was right after that it was a couple within three years the state of Israel was created and they, and they, so the Jews could go back to back to uh, their homeland which was promised to them by Abraham you know centuries before that so many people look at the, look at this and say mm. that this is a very strong prophecy. As we were saying before, pro the spirit, people in the spirit world have no time frame. Right, so you know, 25 right. centuries to them, right. to us is forever, but for them it's you know it's now, a while. I don't know if I mentioned this in the last show or not, but Nostradamus seemed to have the same effect. Yes, he would be communicating from a timeless dimension and be predicting things that even to this date, as we speak may just be occurring or yes. happening. Yes. Somebody was just talking to me when you were, uh, he was reading that, mm. and they just told me that that prophecy was dealing with reincarnation and that that same person would in another life be live in a valley where there would be a tremendous war prior to him coming and there would be any bones to prove the people who got killed. Okay. It's possible. Wow. These 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 things are always open to interpretation, you know, different ways. And and right. like and the Bible's been, right. you know, been been uh, analyzed so many different ways. Right. Good. Well, that's new information. Yes. Wow. Well, I should copy this tape <laughs> when it runs back, and right. then then I'm sure you'll be off in another direction mm -hmm. researching that. Right. Mm -hmm. And that that's how it happens, folks. When you tune into this show, in case you haven't figured some of this out. Um, Entities will communicate to Carl certain bits of information about things. And Sidney initially st started out disproving a lot of this because it mm -hmm. went against his religious background and beliefs. He wanted to disprove me. <laughs> <laughs> he thought I was a fraud. And has continued and found that frog. much of what has been communicated through you is in fact the truth and very interesting and unfolding before our eyes now in history. Right. Um, I certainly didn't hmm. go campaigning for this. Yeah. <laughs> and there were times that I just wish that I did not have this gift because there have been, I've been, as far as I'm concerned, I've been through the pits of hell uh, being a medium. I really have. Being able to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm sure Yeah, that's but my not, parents were yeah. very Baptist and they all turned against me and I was an outcast. Mm. Never, my father never did anything, even didn't he shake my hand. Really? I mean, I was such an outcast to touch me, it was like touching the devil. It was terrible. Wow. I don't even want to go there. Let's go on. Okay. Um, I hate to wrap up the show, but you I'm going to start to do soon? that. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's almost the hour. Yeah. But I did want to throw in one question from a viewer who emailed us. And if the two, between the two of you, you could answer this pretty quickly. Um, I would also like that to be shared with our viewers because I think it has some validity with maybe what some of our viewers have experienced or gone through to some extent. Yeah. Um, and one of the viewers uh, sent us an email. Um, she's a mother of four girls. And evidently the middle child who was born a boy um, and he was born with a heart defect died within three days of his birth, even though the doctors had tried to operate on him and save him. 
and this happened quite a few years ago maybe a words of fifteen years ago and she's still been devastated and she has watched some of the episodes of the show it's and she wants to know why did something like this happen? okay there are times that a spirit that uh, enters a child enters into the body body will withdraw because they figure they found out that they have come back at the wrong time or they've chosen the wrong vehicle okay. and uh, I said to him the time that they gave me this lecture, I said, that's a terrible thing to do for the, you know, for the mother and father. That's mm -hmm. awful. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the only answer they gave me, that's the way it is. Okay. And I've, I can't get that out of my mind, that okay. answer they gave me. That's the way so it is. So that young boy, that baby, was not intended no. to come through in that lifetime. It, no. It's really just as simple as that. Yeah. That and could be hard for people to... So I said, are you, are, you, are you referring to, I say, crib deaths? They said, same thing, crib deaths. Right. Even sometimes, sometimes a child is perfectly healthy, and if the soul, there's a certain amount of time that mm -hmm. the soul can withdraw. When they withdraw, they leave the parents, my God, devastated because the baby is dead. Because when the spirit... This leaves the body. The mm. body doesn't exist anymore. The body's gone. Thank you, Carl. I hope that helps some of our viewers. We have about two minutes left uh, to wrap the show here. I don't know if you wanted to add something no, really quickly, Sydney. Nope. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to wrap up the show and remind our viewers that these two gentlemen have published a book. Uh, My First Encounter with an Angel, Revelations of Ancient Wisdom. Um, for information on how to purchase the book, at the end of the show, there'll be a phone number and an address. Our email address is making underscore known at yahoo.com. If you'd like to see copies of this show and other shows come to your area, contact the phone number at the end of the show. And you can also contact the local Adelphia studio here. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to Sydney Schwartz thank and you, Carl Tina. Hewitt. Thank you. And thank you, viewers.